screen on and still burning. So that is really interesting. I think I think it's I really just think it's skin health. Yeah. And uh, fruits and vegetables are the best thing for your skin. Interesting. One thing I wanted to ask you is, after you switched to the raw food diet, you probably had some immediate effects that were beneficial. It sounds like you immediately saw improvements. Was there anything that arose, say, like three, four, five years down the line that surprised you? Like, I, I know you've indicated there's just been continuing improvement in performance and athletic performance, but did you notice any other, like, I, like one person I'm thinking of is Don Bennett. I think he, he had eyesight issues, and it took about 10 years but eventually his eyesight corrected after that time. I was wondering if anything like that happened for you. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's definitely some things happen quickly and some things take, take years for sure. Uh, for me, mainly what comes to mind is just uh, emotional things, just emotional growth, just, you know, just, just developing as a person. You, know, you just can't see, you can't resolve certain issues until you get to a certain stage of, <laughs> of resolving other issues. So uh -huh. for me, you know, yeah. There was there was a lot you know my I, I worked for IBM for 15 years and and the last you know two years before that before I left IBM I felt a lack of fulfillment I felt um, unfulfilled by by the career just I, I liked the work it was interesting uh, the people I enjoyed the people I was looking at this that's solving complex challenging problems um, for businesses but at the end of the day I didn't believe in what I was contributing to I didn't believe in building the cities and helping insurance companies and banks to get richer and and right. it wasn't what I believed in so uh, I'd walk away from projects and never think of the work again so at that point I was kind of just really working for money alone and that wasn't enough so that's when I got it more into the lifestyle coaching healthy lifestyle consulting kind of field yeah and since you mentioned that could you tell the viewers the name of your website and uh, maybe YouTube channel and um, any books you've written or any anything you'd like them to know about sure I have my own website raw Aussie athlete r-a-w-a-u-s-s-i-e-a-t-h-l-e-t-e dot com yep. and on there I have stories about my various um, ultra marathon experiences my 29 day water fasting experience uh -huh, uh, which is yeah. brilliant uh, and and just just all anything you know, you know lots of interesting things I, I post there. I run retreats um, twice a year, one in Thailand for two weeks. Mm -hmm. The details are there on that website. And I also run a retreat in Australia each November. Great. I am writing a book, so sorry it's not ready yet. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Could you could you, could you describe a little bit just briefly? I know most of it's on your site, but a little bit what happens at a retreat. Yeah, uh, so let's focus on the Thailand retreat because that's just so much fun. Yeah, we uh, there's Thai massage included for an hour every day. There's we go to there's a nine tier waterfall that's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. There's we go to beautiful beaches. We go to a fruit festival that's on at the same time as the retreat. We we have uh, open discussions, so just you know, talking about kind of real things. So, including a lot of emotional, emotional how how people feel about things, and and share with each other, and we can share our experiences and and be better for it. People get people really let their guard down because it's such a safe environment. And, it's almost like a sounds like group therapy kind of. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and I think life should be group therapy. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I like that. Yeah, because you know who wouldn't want to grow more? Like, why, would you, why would you not want that? Why would you not want that? And we we do exercise each day, maybe some yoga, maybe some running, you know, something something crazy, maybe jumping up and down bleachers or <laughs> a local stadium. Yeah, and, and we make we usually have simple, just kind of fruit based uh, breakfast and, and lunch, and then we'll have a prepared meal for for dinner, which will you know could be any any kind of like making noodles out of zucchini and putting some delicious sauce over the top made from Thai ingredients. We try to make authentic kind of you know coconut based or whatever Thai That's ingredients great. and it's it's really it's really an amazing time. That's neat. That's neat. Yeah. How many people did you get at your last uh, retreat in Thailand? Um there's usually there's there's about 20 of us. I, I kind of cap it at 20 because it's just easier to to manage a group of twenty than than more. Okay, <laughs> the retreats yeah. in Australia, I I 
sometimes you know have 30 or even 35 and that's that's a total different totally different dynamic i like the group to be mobile in thailand so we can just jump in the back of two taxis with with 20 people in thailand with the the benches in the back of the taxis mm -hmm. so that that's very convenient all right uh one thing i'd like you to share with viewers a little bit is the buying of large quantities of fruit and storage and that sort of thing uh, do you does do you have a, a room that looks kind of like a produce store? Uh, tell tell us a little bit about that. Well, most of my year is is traveling around these these days. This year, I've actually been in Australia for only seventeen days, and it's it's already November. So <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, I'm I'm about to spend the last two months of the year in Australia, but yeah. So so at home, no, I don't have a I don't have a big storage like that because my family doesn't eat the same way I do. So the house wasn't designed for that purpose but at the events i go to we have big fruit bodegas and and yeah it's definitely uh it's definitely a really you, you need somewhere to, to be able to store and ripen fruit and have some sort of shelving system where you can you know put bananas up higher if you want them to ripen faster or put them lower if you want them to to slow them down uh you know some people have used a stair staircase in the house to to do to achieve that <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can get creative, you know. But yeah, and and then you want to have you definitely want a refrigerator to keep greens fresh. Yep. But uh, ideally, you want to be able to pick fresh greens from your garden every day. They're not they're not difficult to grow. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But now that's interesting. You say that they have fruit bodegas at these events you go to, and and is the fruit ge fruit generally ripe there? Uh, I mean, we we buy. According to our needs, so okay. So you let you know, it ripen. We, we we in Costa Rica at because um, I'm the I'm also the the director of education at Food and Sport, foodandsport.com. Yes. So I go to all the um, help help with all the all the food and food and sport events. So in Costa Rica, they run a, a water fasting event and a and a walking tour, which is like hiking through beautiful trails in Costa Rica. And yeah, at that event, we you know we'll buy a racine of bananas that. That will be green bananas because they, they they come better from the market that way they you know if they were ripe they'd get all smashed up you know, during the journey and then we just hang the hang them up in the fruit bodega and they they're ready you know five seven days later gotcha and we gotcha. can control we can control this the speed of the ripening beautiful yeah one thing I'd like to hear your thoughts on is something I'm running up against with what I guess are, are vegetarians or, or cooked vegans who feel that a raw food diet is, is extreme and that um, it's somehow not as, uh, not as sustainable or uh, the accessibility would be difficult for folks. And I, I, I haven't made the comparison myself personally. It seems like it's a more natural diet to be eating fruit. It, of, course, of course, biologically, physiologically, it's more natural. Uh, what have you come to conclusions about regarding a fruit-based diet and the environment compared to, say, a, a grain-based uh, vegan diet and the environment? Yeah, well, I mean, a, a grain, when we've seen the, the damage that grain crops cause to the land, you know, that there's dust bowls all across the U.S. Yeah. From, from just grain, growing grains year after year after year in the same, same location. And, and grains are a two-dimensional crop, so you don't get... You know, it's just flat along the, on land. You don't get the three-dimensional yield like you get from a from a fruit tree. If you've, if you've ever seen like you know, fifty-year-old mango trees, they produce so produce enough fruit for a small community. You know, it's 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 unbelievable. Great point. Great point yeah. So I mean, I don't think I don't think grains can compete for fruit as far as from an environmental perspective and and using less land to produce more calories. Yes. Yeah. And better quality cal um, calories as well. There's That's so much more nutrition in a mango than than in wheat. Right. Uh, and I think you know you talked about people, um, you know, like vegetarians or, or or vegans, you know, kind of resistant to the to the raw movement and 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 you know thinking it's not such a great idea. I think some of those people. Um, Perhaps feel uncomfortable about it, and I think whenever you, whenever there's something that makes you feel uncomfortable, uh, rather than kind of hiding from that, I think, I think it's probably something that you should in your life that you should look into. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. You know, anything like people feel like discomfort, and they they 
no one wants to feel bad. No one wants to feel sad. No one's, but I, I feel the other way. I feel like if you're feeling something, there's a reason for it and, and you should, you know, you should dive in and, and, and figure out why and experience the feelings and let them be. Even if you don't even understand why you're feeling something, just acknowledging it and experiencing it, it will process and you'll feel better for it. So. I like that. Face it. Face it and investigate yeah. it. Explore it. Yeah. Yeah, I believe our bodies are perfect. Uh, our bodies always make the, the most intelligent decision based on the conditions that it's provided with. And we can control all of those conditions and that's our job to, yeah. to provide ideal conditions for our body. So, so we can thrive, but our body, our body always does everything for us. You know, yeah. We can put a Band-Aid on a cut, but our body's still healing it from the inside out. We didn't heal it by putting a Band-Aid on. <laughs> we like to think we're in control, but you know, we don't know how, our, how, our, how we, you know, when we were conceived and then our cells multiplied and then we grew a spinal cord and a brain and our body did all that. We didn't have to think about it. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty good deal. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Grant, I, I will probably keep continuing but I, I've taken you over an hour if you need to stop just tell me no you're, you're good we're good okay um, I would love to hear a little bit about the fasting and how you came to that uh, I know that uh, some folks get concerned as people get onto a raw food diet there's a big emphasis on making sure that people get enough calories and then if you start talking about fasting that this can confuse people so uh, I'm, I'm a big natural hygiene fan. I, I've known about natural hygiene for many, many years. And uh, I, I love some of those old teachers. I think they were great. I think we stand on their shoulders. And uh, I wonder, just to say a little bit about fasting and how that played a role in health for you. Yeah, well, firstly, I, I don't think that fasting is part of a healthy lifestyle going on. I don't think it should be an ongoing, regular thing. I think it's something you do to as a fast way to get your health back on on track so if you're off the rails and, and you're ready to make a new start fasting a short you know a fast is, is going to enable your body to get get back into a stable sort of position where it's healed various you know healed your digestive tract and and just kind of you're in a better position to move forward from and then introduce healthy foods and and all the other healthy lifestyle factors like exercise and and sunshine yeah. and, and, and move forward from there. So, you know, if someone was to come to me and say, how, what's the best way to go 80, 10, 10, I would say do a, do a two or three day water fast, which is safe to do without supervision. I, I, I think supervision is required for anything kind of longer than that because things can go wrong even in, even in a five or 10 day water fast. Do a two or two or three day water fast, and then and then introduce um, a single fruit like bananas or mango or something that's in season that you can access that you're going to enjoy, and just eat that one fruit for for a number of days, maybe maybe even a whole week. Yeah. And then introduce other foods on top of that, um, like you know the other the other fruits and vegetables, just kind of one or two at a time, and until you're back to a full full eighty ten ten diet. And and by doing that sort of process, you're not you're not feeling like you're uh, it takes a lot of the stimulation and variety out. out. It, it, you're overcoming um, that you're giving up salt and other things like that um, because you're, you're fasting. You're just drinking water. It's like so it's and all like your taste buds heal. Kind of like a clean break. A clean break. Yeah, I, th I really think that's the most solid way to to get into the diet and lifestyle. But um, but people don't realize that <laughs> at that point. So they do what they yeah. do. It's interesting. So I, it's interesting that the public, uh, oftentimes, there's this misconception about fasting and this kind of, again, you talked about face your fears. There's kind of this fear about fasting. It's like, heaven forbid we miss a meal, you know, and uh, it's, it's interesting how deeply embedded that is in, in popular well, culture. Fasting is all about fears. I mean, you can't fast without facing your fears. <laughs> like, yeah. you're, you're taking away all you got. It's like when you change to a healthy diet, you know, you can't. It's very difficult to to dull and numb yourself eating eighty ten ten, for all vegan. <laughs> right? Yeah. So you can't just overeat. You can still eat too much. You could still just go and binge on fat, but then you're not really doing eighty ten ten. Right. But, but you can't. You don't have all the cooked oils and heavy foods that just wipe you out and put you into a coma. Um, yeah. You know all the animal food. Animal foods that just take out so many hours to digest. It's just drain drains your nerve energy. I think um, I don't know. I'll, I'll talk about just a bit about my fasting experience. So I fasted for 29 days in 2008. 
I, 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 I'd read a little bit about fasting. I'd had I'd, some of my friends had, had done short fasts, maybe 10 days, and they'd had good experiences. So I believed in fasting and, and I, so I, I was an advocate of fasting, but I, I would have felt jealous to recommend fasting to somebody having not tried it myself. Yeah. So one of, one of the major reasons I, I fasted was really just to experience it because I wanted to be you know, a health consultant going forwards and, and I wanted to be able to influence people and, and I needed to understand this thing, fasting. Yes. Beyond just the, the words in, in the textbooks. And Did you do your fast with Dr. Graham? I did, yeah. So that was in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was supervised fast and, and there's 100 hours of lectures throughout the fast. Wow. And he keeps you there for another for every for every two days of fasting. He keeps you there for another one day of recovery time with him. So to ensure that by the time you go home, you're you're you know, you're able to carry age and you're you're in good shape. You know, you're not right. going back because some some fasting centers will just let people fast up until the last day they're there and then just send them home. And that's not a recipe for success. <laughs> <laughs> I've done so, that. I've done that. I did a two week fa fast and well. No, she didn't. She didn't let me go. She, she. I had about four or five days of eating before I went back. So, but, right. but yeah, I, I could see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I fasted for twenty nine days, and and Dr. Graham said to me uh, at the end of that, he said, he said, Grant, six months from now, you're going to be soaring to new heights in your athletic performances. It's like, wow, that sounds like a really long time, but okay. And six months later, I did a, I did a, a, a race that I'd done, you know, several years earlier, like every, every year um, yep. in, yep. in recent years. And so I could use it as a benchmark. And, and just to step back before I fasted, I, so I did the race in, I'd done the race in 22, 22 and a half hours for several years in a row uh, on, a, on a cooked vegan diet. Yep. And then I went... 80 a year, and did the race again, and did it two and a half hours faster. So that was wow. 19, 19 and a half hours for 60 miles through mountains. And then, and then I fasted and did the same race again six months after the fast, which was another year gone by in the race, from the, since the race, and I did it in another two and a half hours faster. So wow! It was, you know, it was. <laughs> So I took off five hours off my race time in two years just by eating eight, eight and ten and fasting, and also through recognizing the importance of recognizing the importance of sleep and, and being more well rested, which is something that I learned through fasting. Ah, interesting. But one of the most profound things I got from the fast was that it was the first time that I'd allowed myself to do nothing as an activity, to just be me and not have an agenda and not you know because I was always you know, kind of a high achiever, like I'll, I'll do this, this and this. And then when I, once I've achieved those things, I can, I can do these other things. And always had this plan of, of baggage that I carried around with me. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was, I didn't realize until I was fasting that, that I was doing that, that I, that I was for the first time allowing myself to just be me and be comfortable with that and allow myself to just rest and just lie there and be, and, and know that everything's okay and I'm not wasting my time and I'm not doing nothing and being lazy and all these things that we're told. Right. Uh, and, and I got so much benefit from just spending that time alone with myself beyond the other benefits of fasting. Just, uh, I just grew so much and I'd wake up towards the, the end of the fast. I'd be, I was either asleep or in a deep state of rest for up to 16 hours a day. And, uh, during that time I'd wake up at, you know, sometimes wake up at one o'clock in the morning. I remember waking up and just having lists of things in my head and I had to write them down to get back to sleep and, and there were lists of things like what gives me pleasure in life, what you know, strategies to change my career and what, what I wanted to do and just the, the, the things that I truly valued in life, not not the superficial, um, you know, materialistic kind of values that we're that we're all measured by. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting that you say that because I guess in the modern day for those that are interested in fasting, it's oftentimes about health that they're doing it. But I think in older times, the primary reason for fasting was spiritual reasons. So, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. You look back through time at who, who was known for fasting and it's all the spiritual teachers right. throughout time. 
So yeah, but 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 these days, what we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of athletes coming through the the fast with Dr. Graham now, fasting for athletic performance. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's incredible. We had we had like a you know, Jamaican four hundred meter um, hurdle champion, Olympic you know Olympic um, Olympic four hundred meter hurdler, and 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 he's fasting to overcome you know some some issues he was having and. And yeah, you know, he's back into it, and he's doing great. Uh, it's uh, it's it's just really cool to see people so motivated to to not just like stimulate themselves to to perform well, but actually gain health to perform well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a, right? what an amazing concept. Because because athletic performance <laughs> is usually seen as a short. That there aren't a lot of old athletes, and I don't know the ones that I tend to see that are old that are still performing well. Are vegan or raw vegan or you know that's very interesting very interesting yeah. and have have the studies you've seen borne out that long-term high protein intake has a negative effects on the body ie kidneys and other issues yeah yeah I think I, I believe that's true yeah absolutely um, and even just from a you know I'm sure you know the argument of, of the uh, you know, acid forming things going into your blood when you when you eat grains or meat or other things that that cause your that put more acidic minerals into your blood than than alkaline minerals, your blood can't go acidic, so it buffers with calcium, and you you can end up with osteoporosis um, right. over many years. Well, similarly, if you're eating too many too much protein, you know, so you basically end up too much too many amino acids going into your blood. Um, those excess amino acids, rather than just buffering with with alkaline minerals from your body like calcium. The body can also put some of those amino acids up on the walls of the capillaries, yeah, fine uh -huh. blood vessels, and that blocks delivery of nutri nutrients to your cells. Then, so you're compromising your ability to deliver everything, you know, from calcium to to or even oxygen to your cells at that point, and also compromising the ability to to get waste out of your cells. Very so, interesting. Very um, interesting. You know, along the lines of species-specific diet, which you mentioned earlier. Hmm. What have you read in regard to how similar we are to primates, and do you think that that's a valid and worthwhile argument? I, I run into opposition on this in some uh, chats, you know, on on the internet. Yeah. And uh, Don Bennett had an interesting comment, which was that if you if you look at hom hominids and you you move through a scale of hominids as they approach more and more human-like, the diet is more and more composed of fruit and less and less vegetables and protein um, yeah. and I wonder if you can add anything to that in terms of how species specific a fruit based diet is for us and can, can we glean anything from looking at primates in that regard yeah I mean I, I think that I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that, that any, any animals that are similar to other any species that are similar to eat a diet, uh, you know, my, the main things I've read are, are, are on the on the topics are, are from information from Dr. Graham. Yeah. He has in several of his books, he has information showing all the similarities and um, between various and differences between various um, animals. And you know, it's, it's it's there's no question that we're that we're designed to eat a frugivorous diet. When you list those similarities about you know that we don't have claws and we we don't have uh, yeah, yeah. you know incisors we don't have carnivorous teeth we don't we have a, a long digestive tract um, we you know we get cancer when we eat when we eat meat um, right, right. you know wild cats have some have like a thousand times more strong like strength of stomach acid than we do that that's right. it just you know and they've got a short digestive tract so it just kind of gets in gets digested and, and it's done it doesn't spend and much time there have you ever seen anything more perfectly designed for picking a piece of fruit? <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, and you know, and everything that like if you if you there's a, there's a great book called The Pleasure Trap by Douglas Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer, uh, and you know I think a lot of that information is 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 kind of relevant as well because everything that gives us pleasure is designed for our species to continue to move forward. So, yes, some of those mechanisms can be warped by, um, you know, we can get pleasure from foods which harm us, 
technology, yeah. Because of technology, and it's they're not things that we would find in a natural environment. But yeah. if you if you know if you go and live a simple village life with the things that are available naturally, everything that gives you pleasure, like true pleasure, um, not just like not just immediate gratification, but things that give you true pleasure are the things that help your species to go forward. Um, and fruits and vegetables definitely are, are pleasurable, like a pleasant, um, you know, to eat. To eat a mango, I mean, my mouth waters just thinking about it. But you know, when I see a, a fish swim in a pond or a, a bear running up a mountain, my mouth doesn't water. I don't see a bird fly overhead and, and salivate. You know, I just think, wow, what a beautiful animal. Yes, that's. You no, know, I just want to connect with it. I, I don't want to eat it. Yeah. And, and but with fruits and vegetables, it's you know, it's love at first bite. <laughs> you know, I love that you're saying all this, and I wonder if you could say a little more about the ethics of of killing animals and how commercial animal production is perhaps not the most ethical human activity. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many stats out there now, you don't have to just do a Google search and you can find so much information, but I mean, the amount of water that's used to to just to to grow cattle, or the amount of grains that are fed to cattle in order to make a small amount of what people call food, right? right. Uh, it's it's just so absurdly not um, not sustainable. Yeah, you know they're cutting down rainforests. It's it's like <laughs> cutting out the lifeblood of the of the, the planet to you know for a short term profit that you know, that won't last. I saw this thing today on Dr. Greger's site, and uh, apparently in these uh, pork production plants, they sever the heads off the pigs and blow the brains out with some kind of air pressurized machine. And then this vaporized pig brain gets absorbed by these people, and they develop illnesses from that over time. Is that not just crazy? That's pretty crazy. That's pretty uh, crazy. I mean... I hate even yeah. I hate even talking about it. It's just so. It's just, <laughs> it's it's just. I mean, what a world we live in where that actually happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. I don't know. People people do strange things. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the like the highest. It's supposed to, apparently, I don't know what the current statistics are, but I remember seeing some stats that the highest. Suicide rate is is from people that work in in abattoirs, right? right. And I think and and I think the only other thing that was remotely close to that was dentists, but <laughs> 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 nobody likes their dentist apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that brings up another good topic. Um, so sometimes people find on a raw food diet that they get teeth issues, and uh, my my conclusion on that is it's primarily dried fruits or unripe fruits and not enough greens. Is that is that what the conclusion you've reached? Yeah, hundred percent. I think I think your teeth need to be in a clean state, you know, at least daily, and your tongue is the best judge of that. If they don't feel clean, then they're not clean. Uh, it doesn't really matter how you clean them, what you use to clean them. Whether it's just a brush and water, or you know, whatever. I've 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 flossed with, with pieces of grass out on the trails, you know. Yeah, sometimes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's good. Um, but yeah, I, and and it's it's really difficult to have to keep your teeth clean when you're eating dried fruit. Yeah. With any regularity, or if you're not eat, if you are eating it, then then eat it with greens or something like that, so it just doesn't stick to your teeth. It and it's the same. It's not just um, dried fruits either. It's um, it happens with other diets, like like anything that sticks to your teeth. Anything dry sticks to your teeth, so it can be from toast or from huh. other dried foods. So it's not the problems aren't unique to 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 raw vegans. Yeah. But yeah, you, you definitely need to look after your teeth. The a lot of people, um, myself included, have have seem to have a period go through a period where you think that fruits and vegetables can't hurt your teeth because you're eating naturally and <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. So yeah. You yeah. wouldn't have a you wouldn't have a toothbrush in nature, right? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice, it's it's a beautiful idea, uh, but you look at you look at people that are still living fairly kind of tribal lives, and and they they do use things to clean their teeth. Huh. They do use you know various blades of grass or certain. You know, I, in Thailand this year, I, I bought um, 
what they call toothpaste tree powder, which is a brown powder. It's think of it something like cinnamon or nutmeg or huh. uh, and and you just dip your brush in and just brush your teeth and and it's so easy and it doesn't leave a all that like taste residue so you can't enjoy your food that the toothpaste does. Um, right. It works really well. It's just, it's just slightly abrasive and and it, I think it's got some of the qualities of um, just like, you know, killing bacteria or whatever in, in your mouth. Right, right. I think it's from the neem tree, but I haven't been able to confirm that. Okay, yeah. But, uh, it works really well. Yeah. I've heard of, I think, tea tree, tea tree oil, I think I've heard of them using for, for dental uh, yeah. cleaning. Yeah. I'd be concerned about having oil in your mouth, just coating things. And ah, uh, yes. I I don't know. Okay. But, but yeah, like, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if your mouth feels clean, it's 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 good. Yeah. There's one thing that I meant to ask you earlier, so I'm going to jump back a little bit. I'm curious, when you did your 29 day fast, did you get a, a cleaning of the tongue. I remember in, in natural hygiene literature it said there was sometimes this notion of fasting to completion. completion. And yeah, and that when that occurred that the tongue would get this kind of healthy looking pink. Did that occur for you or Yeah, it it wasn't um 100% clean like 100% clean, but I think compared to most other people that I've seen fast, and I've seen hun several hundred people fast now with Dr. Graham in the last 6 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, around 10, I remember around 10 days or so into my fast that, that the person that was monitoring me noted that it was, that it had cleaned up and it was, it was pretty clear. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't, I don't believe we don't, we don't at food and sport. Certainly we don't, we don't advocate fasting to completion. Okay. Uh, yeah. we would rather somebody da do two 30 day fasts than do a 60 day fast or a 50 day fast. Ah, interesting. You know, like 40 or 50 days is, it's a long time and it, you really, you know, you really, it's, it can be a gamble to like, you know, do you, it's different with life-threatening situations, I guess, but um, you're really playing with, playing dangerously with your health at, at that point, doing really long fasts. Mm -hmm. It's because when you fast, you're, you're using your body's reserves. Okay. So... You know, you're still going to be producing vitamin D, but pretty much everything else you just, <laughs> apart from water, you, you're getting from your body's reserves. So minerals at some point are going to start getting low and at some point, you know, all the things we need to, for our physiology to work are going to start getting low. And so there, there is a limit to how long you can fast safely. And we find that pretty much anyone that's not dangerously underweight, I've never seen anyone have a problem fast for three or four weeks. Yeah. But once, yeah. You, get over, once you get over four weeks... It's a different story. I've seen uh, people do 30, 34 days, and it, and it starts. It's different. It's different to, to just four weeks. The fifth week is definitely different. That's a great great point. Um, did you did you have any detox experiences over the twenty nine days? Did you have like I remember when I fasted, uh, there'd be a couple of days of kind of nothing going on, and then something would start eliminating a little bit, and then it would go back to to kind of even keel, and then something would eliminate. Did you experience that a little bit? Um, well, I had a had a bowel movement. Speaking of elimination, I had a bowel movement on day two and day seventeen. Um, and day seventeen was really weird. It was like little little marble sort of perfectly huh. formed because it had been so long in my digestive tract. Wow! Uh, and that was, was yeah. That was after a year of eating eighty ten ten, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it wasn't like a, like like the mucoid plaque thing they talk about is is a myth, you know, but. Yeah. It wasn't like anything black and disgusting coming out. It was just it was just from the meals that I'd eaten before I fasted. But for whatever reason, on day seventeen, it was it was time to come out, and you you know your bowels know know how to handle poop. So <laughs> I left. I was happy to leave it in their control, and it, it was it was effortless. Um, and you know, I, I ate mangoes as my last meal before my fast, and and when I when I broke um, the fast, I ate watermelon for about three days, and yeah, you know, when I when I pooped. It was it was an effortless, actually quite a pleasant experience. Um, I was I was I just I was shocked. I'd never seen anything come out like it before. It was like it was like my absorption was just like working so much better. Wow! It, it just it was noticeably different because eating watermelon from the same area before I fasted 
um, because I was there for a few months before I fasted, uh, doing the internship program. Yeah. And um, so things were things were different. Things were working better, and and definitely got me great results. That's amazing. Um, That's amazing. Was a big part of getting me where I am today, but. As far as detoxing, for me, mostly it was just um, mental, emotional cleansing, 